that spoils it before class, right? So, so we're going to talk about soil sampling testing, and once you get a complicated soil testing report, what do you do with it, right? So I think we're going to try, um, <laughs> we're going to try dismantling um, some of those things here. So the first thing is, why are you testing a soil sample, right? So, I mean, I think we all know that if you do a soil testing, you're trying to find out does the soil have the ability to provide nutrients that crops do? Like that's the first thing. And if you can figure out whether the soil has ability or not, the main your interest is uh, that will the application result in a profitable response in terms of nutrients. Like so, we do soil testing to measure soil's ability, which in turn provides indication if you will get a profitable response from application of nutrients. Pretty simple. All right. So when we so we do soil testing for nutrient contents and pK, you can also do micro. I highly suggest including that. Most of soil testing labs offer that. Um, and I think you already probably got enough beaten on soil pH as I right hear. So we do soil pH uh, for lime additions, which is again we want to get the pH in the right place before you start thinking about other nutrients. So there are sort of four steps in soil testing, right? So it begins with, with you or someone going in the field and collecting a good sample, and we're gonna spend a lot of time on this, and then you ship the sample, and then you're at the mercy of lab gods. <laughs> they will do whatever they wanna do. Um, the good thing is after they do the step two, three, four, they're gonna do everything for you. They're gonna test the sample, they're gonna interpret the results, and they're gonna really have a recommendation but this is where you come into the play to make sure that their interpretation is good and the recommendations line up with what you think based on your local knowledge. Okay, so, so here is the bigger challenge with sort of soil testing. So like think for a second, like so if you look at one acre and you're taking a sample from six inches, you're dealing with two million pounds of soil. So it's a lot of soil. Um, when you are sending a sample to the lab, you're filling a soil back. Right, pretty much. So hopefully after this talk, no one is going to dig up two million and try shipping to a lab, right? So that's the simple <laughs> message. Don't do that. And if you've got 10 acres, that's a lot of soil. So you're gonna take a tiny fraction, you're gonna send it to lab, lab's going to take a tiny amount of that sample, test it, and that's where all the recommendation and interpretation, interpretation is based on. So what that means is you really need to make sure that the sample that you are sending to the lab represents the field. And how do you do that? And that's what we're going to talk about here today. But this is also the largest source of error. If you don't send the right sample, you're not going to get the right recommendation, right? So if you're in a hurry and you want to grab two samples from the field and send it, don't do it. Go get a six pack and sample on another day in the same field when you have more energy and enthusiasm to do that. So make sure you get a really good sample. Um, again, talking about here, this is our traditional approach because we said just, just walk around the field, WM, whatever works for you, um, get enough samples, that's the sort of idea here. Like So here we suggest that you take you know, 15 to 20 codes per acre, per 20 acre field, you grab one sample from one place in the field, go around in the field with one bucket, now you've got these 20 codes in a bucket, mix them very nicely. Um, and then out of that bucket, you grab one sample, fill the soil sampling bag, and send it to the lab. And hopefully, that sample represents what was in the field. Um, so here is the soil cores. Or, I mean, the, digging soil cores, uh, you know, is challenging. We were out last week trying to sample uh, 150 acre field, and it gets tiring. And there was alfalfa, and we had to walk there. And it's like, can I just take a sample from this side and I don't have to walk? So I mean, I, I hear you, this is not an easy part, but this is where it's very critical. That's why you need fresh energy and enthusiasm that I want to do a representative swap sample. So here is some slide from Oklahoma. Don't ask me if this is published or not. I think this is just made up data, but I think it's pretty accurate. It's Oklahoma, so I'm sure it represents an accurate information. But the idea is solid, right? So let's say you go in the field, 
and you're only getting you know less than five, six samples in that scenario, you're going to have high variability. This is not any parameter to think about phosphorus potassium, which is natural because the field has high variability if you're only taking few cores, which they're not going to represent a whole, right? But as you start taking more cores, you get into 15 or 20, um, then you begin seeing sort of less variability in the field. And this, of course, varies in some fields. Some fields are fairly uniform. Are the fields that have never received any manure application, you're going to pretty much see, and you have the same soil texture, same soil series, very similar. Uh, most of the fields that we have that have received manure application over a longer period of time, they are the fields who are going to have high variability. So you want to pay a little bit more attention in taking more cores if you want to a little few more water in that situation. Here's another idea. Once you, and the best way to sort of see is, you go in the field and you see that corn or beans don't look same in the field, right? And this tells you, this is your indication that there is something going on in the soil fertility other than a low spot in the field. So what do you do here? This is where the idea of sort of more precision grade sampling comes into the play. This doesn't need to be done in a field that's a fairly uniform. But if you do spot a field that's highly variable, uh, again, this requires a lot more samples you know, from zones, which also means more money when you're trying to analyze it. Um, the good thing is this is something you don't have to do every time. This is just, in the beginning, just do one-time thing if you find things with high variability. So with that, you will get a good idea that you can sort of see, okay, you know, the, the top of the field has this value, the bottom of the field has less value. But you need, in order to do that, you need to take a lot of samples in that field. Um, and here is a sort of an example. So we were doing this, a student project, this is in Frederick County. So we went to sort of two dairy um, farms. So there's a, like a one pasture here. This is about three acres. Um, there was another one, you can probably see dairy right next to this. Um, this was actually a grazing pasture. Um, this was more dairy pasture. So th three acre, two acre, right? So we, we are like, let's take how many as many samples as possible from these fields because we're trying to get ideas. So in this case, we actually had, you know, 18 zones in that field. Like, so that's, that's a lot of zones. So you're looking at one fourth to one sixth of an acre, one grid. Um, so we took a lot of samples and, we, and from each of these boxes, we took nine composite samples. And then we made one sample. So in other words, we got a value for each of these numbers, right? So, um, next thing you're going to see is the phosphorus data. So this is the first field, three acres. These are all those 18 grids, the boxes that we talked about. So when we analyze, this is a field with low to medium level. And if you see, you know, there's a variability. It goes from 22 to 53. But pretty much you're in the low to medium category. So in this, in this case, you, you're probably, your average is going to be somewhere here in the medium category. So if you apply your recommend, fertilizer recommendation based on whatever you're doing, you're pretty good here, right? So not a whole lot of variability in this field. This is also a sort of a graze posture uh, where the cattle go in different places. So uh, we were surprised that it doesn't have a whole lot going on. The other field right next to dairy farm was a whole different story. So again, we had 12 grids, and if you look at the average, you are getting about 92 FIV, which is your optimum category. But if you look at the range, this is where the trouble is. So you're going anywhere from the medium to the excessive category. So there are two scenarios. Um, if you have a sample like this, composite sample, you get this number, uh, and then you will have recommendation based on the optimum level, which is good for all the grids, but you're adding more than it needs to be, right? So you are actually creating a hotspot in the field that's already high in phosphorus, that doesn't need any more phosphorus, which means you're over applying. Um, the downside is that if you're basing recommendations on 91 number, you have grids 34, 68, 56. These are the sections of the field that need more phosphorus. So in this case, they are not getting sufficient phosphorus. So what's going to happen is you're going to have a yield penalty in those areas of the field that are not getting sufficient, and you are going to have no yield gain in those sections, anything that's you know, 80, 90 above in that category. I think there's a question. We're going to hang on to that since this is being recorded. Um, so, the, so this is part of the challenge. Like this is high variable field. This is where if precision sampling, I mean, we overkilled it, <laughs> but you can just kind of do less grids, but will be very useful. So on that basis, now we can make a map 
to see which part of the field need less fertilizer, which need more fertilizer, and then you can actually help farmers save fertilizer in those grades that have high, uh, and making sure that farmer can add more in other sections where it's needed. Um, the next question is, this is always seems tricky, like, okay, which test should I sample, right? So you have a different goals. If you're doing PX, since we are, most of our crop land is under no-till or pasture systems, if you are taking PX, you want to take the two-inch sample, and this is because that's where most of the action is happening. We are not incorporating residues. Manure goes there. When they start decomposing, there's a more acidity generated on the surface. So you want to make sure that you get that sample in no-till and pasture systems. Uh, our general soil sample, this is general fertility, you know, that's eight inches. Uh, there's another one called, uh, this is the fall, um, you know, the test that we do for small grains. Um, uh, I'm not sure how many people do, but you can use the same sample. And on that time, if you're doing soil fertility, this is another one, pre site rest nitrate uh, that some farmers do. This is, again, free with your advisors. Um, so I highly suggest doing it. This is something you do. You know, early in the season when corn is grown to see if there's a more need for nitrogen fertilizer. So great way to sort of look at split applications and this is free with the county advisor, so encourage your farmers to, to use that. All right, so again, when you're considering sample collection, we just talked about problem areas or the grades which are high, but there could be another scenario than the field, and this is this picture is for more dramatic purposes, as you can see. <laughs> That if you have a problem area in different parts of the yard or field, you definitely want to take a separate sample. Don't combine with the other sample because it's going to mess up the whole number that you will get. Um, the next question is, when should you take sample? And you know, it's like everyone has their own things they want to do. Some people do fall sampling, some people do spring sampling. But whatever you are doing, you can take any time as long as the ground, the ground is not frozen or rotten. Don't take sample right after a big thing. Um, right, so again, look into the follow the same sort of system that you have done, like taking soil sampling. We see a lot of variability in soil sampling analysis on the same field, and it's because two people going in the field are going to take samples very differently, right? Um, but the key is you want to make sure that you are getting the same codes. If in one year you got 25 codes, other year you got seven codes, you're going to have a different number, and then you will have trouble sort of blaming in which sample should I trust, like, so make sure that you have conversation with farmer or whoever is taking the sample, make sure they are consistent. Uh, again, think about it, if you have a really bad sample and you send it to a lab, they're going to hate you forever, right? You will be blacklisted. So <laughs> make sure that you send a sample that's not bad, that's reasonably dry, and again, just going back to the idea that no, don't go out because it's raining and put go somewhere, let's take some soil samples, don't do that. Um, so again, exercise judgment, and I think you will be fine. Again, think about it, like I like to think about it, taking soil samples, so fall is good weather to take samples, because you could be out, but if you can get to the field in early spring, that might actually be a better sample, because it's closer to whatever you are trying to do. Like, so you could sample in fall, you tested it, um, and there's a long winter, and we don't know how it is going to play out. By the time you get into next sort of spring, a lot of things might have changed, right? So depending on the circumstances, I think you will get a slightly more precise data analysis if you actually do a spring sampling, especially with some of the nutrients that we're talking about, nitrogen and other, other things. All right, the good thing is all this complicated information has been written by Brian Comeback in a very nice extension fact sheet, <laughs> um, which is free to download, and I'm sure Brian can um, send you a link. If you have a PDF or PowerPoint version, if you click on this highlighted, I think it will let you download that file. So it's an easy three, four page read that talks about all the sort of nuances of soil sampling. All right, so you've done your work, right? Now open that six pack can that you, that you got a few days ago and sit back and let the lab do work for you. Uh, believe it or not, most labs actually do a really good job. The key is the lab need, you want to check. This is another issue that has recently come up because there's a national, what's called a proficiency testing program, which means the lab participate in a quality control, quality analysis protocol. And there are some labs who actually have failed the quality control analysis. 
and if you are shipping samples to those labs, that's not going to be pretty, right? So make sure when you are sort of choosing a lab, or if you're going to choose a lab, usually when you pick a lab, most of the time you will be using that lab for a long period of time, right? So pick up a phone and ask them, do you participate in any proficiency testing program? If, and you know, if the lab is participating, they're actually going to be happy to brag about it. <laughs> the one who don't tell you, maybe you want to stay away from them. But there are a couple sources, uh, there's also actually um, some group uh, in the West Coast that recently started doing this, you know, blacklisting of labs uh, who are not doing a good job. And when those labs found out, they actually withdraw from the testing program because if they don't send the samples to them, no one knows how good their analysis is, right? So really pay close attention to this because this has become recently an issue with some labs. But if a lab is participating and you know you have a good sense of the lab is doing a good job, you can almost trust the data that you know, that you're getting from that lab. So most of the labs in our part of the country they will do a routine soil testing. You're going to see pH and exchangeable acidity, which is for lime requirement. Uh, they will also do extractable nutrients. They can also, you can add other things, cation exchange and base saturation. This is something you don't need to do every year. You know, this is something that you can keep tabs on that. Uh, definitely with some of the sandy soils, do micronutrients and just add another two, three bucks and you get like really nice support. Uh, you also have an option to add another. These things, again, don't need to be done every year. And I know our regulators are required to, you know, take a sample every three years. Think about it. Like, a lot of information is based on that swab test that's being done in the field. So if your farmers have the resources and, you know, you can convince them you take a sample every year, you can't beat it. You know, it's additive. You will get a much more precise measurement. I'm not saying you should. But if the circumstances allow, it's really a good thing to go to yearly testing um, despite the regs that we have. It's good for the farmer. It can actually help save fertilizer. And that probably can cover the 9 or 10 bucks that they have to pay for now. All right, so soil pH, you know, it's most critical, easy to analyze. Most of the counties can do it, but, you know, just you're going to do that anyway. Um, another issue that comes up with is why does soil pH keep on decreasing in the soil? Like so, there are a couple of things that are that, 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 that there are a couple of reasons for that. So think about rainfall has water, like water has hydrogen, uh, and hydrogen is one of the acid ions that causes low pH. So that's one factor. But more importantly, when rainfall happens, uh, it washes away other ions like calcium, magnesium, who helps to buffer soil pH. Um, so that's one factor. Um, another plant roots, they're growing in the soil, so they're releasing a lot of stuff back into the soil. Um, in some ways, they're helping to make other nutrients more available, but in the process, they can also generate acidity in the zone of the roots, and that also causes a decline. Uh, another factor, you know, there's a lot of carbon dioxide that plant respire in the roots that also produce a weak acid. But if you look among all the factors, this is part of the story, that when you add nitrogen fertilizer, so yesterday we talked about nitrification process. So if you go into your slides, when you're doing nitrification, you're going to see there's the H ion hanging around in that process. And this is when ammonium is converted to nitrate in the nitrification process, that hydrogen, where is that going to go, right? It goes back into the soil. So the fields that receive more ammonium or urea fertilizer, in that case, as we see more pH decline. But also think about all the reactions, manure, for example. You're adding organic nitrogen or ammonia. That's going to go through the nitrification process, which means that extra H that's being removed from ammonia is going to go back into the soil. So this is common. This is, you know, in the modern world, we use a lot of fertilizers in most fields. So, so that's why we have to keep adding lime to get the pH in the right place where we want it. Um, I'm sure you've seen this slide a million times, but again, all the nutrient availability is affected by pH, and it depends on which, which element that you're looking at. You know, if you have high pH, we don't have high pH soils because we are on the east of Mississippi, temperate climate, we get a lot of rainfall. Um, and when you go in the western part of the world, in Arizona, Utah, that's where you see some of the pH uh, soils with very high pH, very little rainfall, also calcium carbonate, 
uh, the way that whole geography is sort of, you know, made uh, is very different. So though that's where you see Haiti and Swahili. We don't have maybe some pockets here and there, but, but not a whole lot. But I believe PH is easy uh, to done. And again, I think you had a slide, you had a talk online, didn't you? Did someone talk online? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So again, like you had lines doing PH, so I'm just going to go quickly over this. So pretty much you're neutralizing the hydrogen ion by adding lime. If you want to get more into the details, here is a chemical reaction on the test. Um, so you know what's going to happen when you add calcium into the soil. It's going to bump off hydrogen, and now you have more calcium on the soil, which means less acidic conditions. All right, so this is another one. Uh, this is a good one, right? So when you think about liming, you know, you think that you're just the pH, but actually you gain a lot in terms of these three nutrients. So think about if you have the right sort of pH in the soil, it doesn't need to be 6.5, it could be 6.2 and you're okay um, in this case. So that's where you're going to get the maximum nutrient availability. But as you start deviating on the lower end, you know, you might be adding all the fertilizer based on recommendation, but if the pH is not right, it's not going to be available because of all other reasons. So again, with all elements, it varies. So pH is your first diagnostic, you know, easy way to do, to make sure everything is in the same where it needs to be. Now, this is another one, um, because if you think about, you know, like, roots go in different places in the field, like, some crops have very deep root system. In wheat, for example, you can get up to, whatever, six feet, right? When we are liming, we're liming on the surface. And think about in the no-till system, we are not in part of rain. You know, it's just sticking around. So it, that's like, another, and eventually, like, if, if that's why you have to keep adding more to make sure that hopefully you don't have pockets of low pH below soil surface. And in some cases, you won't, because if the fertilizers are always going there, think about nitrification. It's happening in the surface. Like, so usually the surface is more acidic than the lower part. But occasionally, you can have that situation. You know, the roots may find there's a low pH, you know, or high pH that can hurt those. In most situations, it's Good thing it's not an issue, but if there's an incorporation, if there's a concern, for example, in the field where you have a drastically low pH, like 4.5 or 5, um, and you only go to the two inch sample, take another sample at 8 inches. This pH is easy and cheap, and you can really get, get a good idea to make sure the pH is in the right range for the problem. Um, all right, so the labs, they will do extractable nutrients. This is phosphorus, potassium. Um, so the, the soil test, in some ways, is good to see what's in the soil, but it doesn't tell you the whole story, right? So because the idea of the different extractants that we use is to sort of simulate what plants will do in the real situation, right? So when plants will release acids back, that's why some of the recipes for extractants have small acid to sort of simulate what a plant will do in the real situation. So in sort of our part, we use malic-3, and this is a sort of a cocktail of different acids. Uh, I'm not going to go through this, but this is to simulate that when the plant is growing, releasing enzymes and acid back into the environment, it will simulate. So if we take a soil sample and add this cocktail, and it will extract something that might be what will become available over a longer period of time for the plant. So that's the idea of plant availability. Or here we, this is FIV for phosphorus, and here or potassium. And we have other tests, uh, you know, in the in that area or in the world that other people use it. If you go to New York, they actually use another test called Morgan. So the, the point is that when you're testing, make sure you're looking at what analysis was done by lab that we're going to go through. Um, this is another, you know, when you look into the soil, there's nothing like available or unavailable. Like, there's always a sort of a combination, because after this is gone by the plant roots for soil solution, other parts will be released and eventually become available. So this is kind of not sort of clear sort of boundaries of availability and non-availability. And this is what sort of different tests do. So Malik 3 does actually does a really good job in measuring more phosphorus. So in some ways, if you have a Morgan test done and Malik 3 done, that's why it's important to see which test was done. 
Uh, some labs are pretty good. They put in the soil testing report. Other labs don't. So if you don't have, if you don't know what that would be, pick up the phone and call the lab to ask them, hey, what soil test did you use that will give you sort of a better idea um, that where this number should be or could be. Okay, this is another cation exchange capacity. This is like a bank, like so soil works as a bank. Uh, so a soil that has a high cation exchange capacity, which means you know that this bank has high resources to provide more plants, which means it can store more and release it back. A soil with low cation exchange capacity has less ability to engage in those transactions. So ideally, you know, we like soils that have high cation exchange capacity, which means that it can provide more nutrients to the soils without need for external fertilizer. Uh, yeah, I think I just talked about that. Um, and there's another thing that you see on the soil testing report. It's called base saturation, right? So bases are your calcium, magnesium, potassium, um, and then you know sometimes hydrogen comes into play. So pretty much the labs they take all those ions and then it gives you a base saturation, which is actually a good one to look at. Um, and we'll talk about that in some of the soil testing reports. Okay, so lab did all the work, and now they're going to start in spreading that data. So what, what does that mean? Um, and they're going to look at, you know, like the relationship. This is where the soil plant correlation come into play. Um, that the level in the soil versus the yield response. Uh, and this is what they're interested in, in this case, providing you recommendation that if you add this amount, then you can get this yield goal in this example for more. Uh, and this is the soil test interpretation. This is how labs sort of look into in our state, we have these categories of FIV, low, medium, optimum, excessive, uh, and this is the idea with optimum that when you reach a certain sort of point of the nutrient level in the soil, you can no longer increase the yield because there's enough of those nutrients available. And that's why we, our sort of recommendation starts to climb from this point. At this point, it's maintenance only, which means whatever plants are going to be removed, you add that one. So you stay in that level. And this is actually a good place to be in states such as ours where we are regulated once you go above certain categories. So suggest so farmers to, if this is a sweet spot, um, that's regulation. Um, they can just kind of stay under the radar. But how would you get there? So I'm um, that will help you to have. And these are sort of those four categories that you're going to find in many of our essential publications. The low I know, so what does that mean? Okay, so there's a lot of units going on now, right? So different labs doing different things, and sometimes it becomes overwhelming. Um, we we have a soil that we have a text sheet here. This is soil fertility number four that actually talks about urine conversion. So once you get data back from different labs, and some labs actually do a good job, they convert to the ML and FIV value. But if you send to some lab in the other part of the country, um, they might not. Be familiar with what you're doing, so right. So this is this will be a good one to check out to make sure that you're doing the right unit conversions before you start changing things on the field. Um, so again, how so when you get a soil testing report, this is an example. It's going to contain information. It will have the data, the results um, that the lab did, and then they will they will have an interpretation, some time graphical, and then they will also have a section where they will have a recommendation, and that's why when you submit a soil test in the board, sometimes they ask you which crop you will use, right? So that's part of the reason, so they can give you a specific recommendation that you need. So, okay, you got this type of a report, and it's like you want to bang your head on the wall, and what does it mean, right? So this is messy, there's a lot of data, um, and I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not picking on waveline, on work. this is the old report, I think they have to do a much better job. But if you start reading it, this is actually not that difficult. So let, let's let's try that. Well, I tell you a couple of things going on. <laughs> things I'm gonna have another idea. Um, so you have different. I'm gonna start speaking loud so you can hear me better. So you have different samples. Like these are different fields where the samples were sent. And then you have a bunch of different parameters going around. Like so, let's look at OM. So. Um, it's not something that you do when you're doing yoga. This is organic matter, right? So, OM, organic matter person, what's the person? And then you can look at that number, 1.9, and then they have a word called L, which means it's low, right? So pretty easy. And as you go along, then you have M3. 
And this is, again, if you don't know that, this is Malik 3. This is what we use in our state. The next thing you see is units, which is PPM, which is parts per million or milligram per kilogram. So you have this number when lab analyzed, it was 32, right? And this falls into the medium category. And this lab also convert the, this value PPM into the dimension last number we have, which is FIV in our state. So they've done all the work for you. So they're telling you FIV is 37 here. So pretty good for those different fields. Um, and then as you sort of keep going, this is where your extractable nutrients like potassium, calcium, and the same plot here. So you have the actual number, and then you have a category, which is low, medium, high, and then you have the MID, FIV conversion. So pretty simple. Um, and as you keep going, this is your cationic sandy capacity. This is, again, if you requested that analysis. And if you don't have any indication of that, I would suggest doing a sample, you know, every five to seven, eight years, so you have a good idea where the cationic sandy capacity is. The good thing is it doesn't change over a period of time. Like, you can alter CEC a little bit if you're adding water manure. If a field never go, going to get manure, you're not going to change this whole because that's what you got as a part of the package. All right. So it, this is where base saturation comes in, right? So the lab has all the data, calcium, magnesium, um, potassium, and, and again, like hydrogen. So what they do is they take these PPM numbers and they add them together and they express them as a percent of total base saturation. So in most of the fields, you're going to see that you have more calcium and magnesium, which is exactly what you want. Right? If you have a low pH, the hydrogen could be dominant. And there are some fields where the hydrogen is dominant. In this year, it's 1.6, which is tiny. So if you have here 70 to 80% or 90% of food by calcium and magnesium, pretty much you can say this field is in a pretty good shape in terms of lime requirements. You're not going to need a whole lot. And if you requested some other tests like nitrate, this is where they will show up. So. Seems messy, but it's actually not as you start looking at. Well, look at another report. This is from Waters. And actually, you know, pretty good, right? So you get a nice graph, a lot of information here. Uh, so let's uh, dismantle this. Again, you got soil pH here, and then you got a buffer pH. And remember the difference between those two. Buffer pH is used to calculate the lime requirement, right? So not for the other purpose. And in this case, their target pH in this field for that crop is 6.5. Uh, so that, that was the goal here. And then again, you look at extractable nutrient. They also tell you the method that they use. In this case, they use malic 1. And remember, we use malic 3 in our state, right? So again, paying attention to uh, what was done is, is useful. And then uh, they also did a micronutrient. Um, and then you get a little bit more information here. Uh, but if you look at other nutrients, it just tells you L and H and very high. It doesn't tell you the mal and unit conversion. Right? This is where the fact sheet previously, the s form, will be useful. We have an equation, very simple. Uh, you can take that number and convert that into the mal and uh, FIV equal X value. Same thing with the base saturation. So it's all calculated. And then they also done a nice job here. So they put phosphorus based on this analysis that this is low, medium, adequate, high. Again, these categories are not exactly the same as mal and because this lab is just using their own interpretation. This is where you have to kind of take over and see um, how these numbers relate to balance context. But otherwise, very nice report, useful information as you sort of start going through this. And on this basis, they're also going to recommend um, that you, know, you add a little bit of lime because your buffer pH is higher, so you can reduce it to 6.5 to get into the right um, pH zone. All right. Um, I think, let's do another one. So this is from Penn State, the same sort of plot. They gave you sort of the pH here, um, information, nutrient information, and they tell you, you know, where you are, whether you are in the optimum category. So everyone has different categories. So pay attention to where you are shipping the samples, where you are getting the data. Um, but a lot of useful information in the, in the sort of the soil testing report. And just as you can see, they're pretty easy. They're not complicated. They sound complicated. But once you start looking at it, it's, it's pretty easy. Okay. And if you request any additional analysis, they will include it. So I'll just read whatever you have, just to make sure you have a good idea of what's going on in the field. Uh, this is another one. I think this is from Delaware. Uh, so again, like 
everyone has a different format. It would be nice if all the labs have the same layout, <laughs> but again, this is competition, right? So some, some folks are more creative, they want to do a little bit better job, graphical display to make it easier, but the same setup is very similar. You will have some analysis, and in this case, you have a sort of the colors that tells you where you are, and your recommendations in a little bit more detail. Um, but again, most of the times when you select this while testing a lab, like do your due diligence in the beginning and ask those questions uh, that do you participate in raw efficiency testing programs and any other concerns that you have before you ship samples because you are trusting them to do a lot of things for you. So do a little bit work in the beginning so you have that comfort level. Uh, if a lab is close by and you are in that area, I would just say, I want to take a tour of your lab. You will be surprised how many times you go there and you say, oh, I'm not sending my samples here. <laughs> or I might be sending samples here. So if you are in the proximity, just swing by, and they will be happy to give you a tour if they have nothing to hide. Uh, so again, talking about you know a, a results like so again, this is you have know, different complicated units. There's FIV going on, and there's a Delaware version, Malin version, which are pretty similar. Box per million pounds per acre. Again, know which method and units are used, and consult our fact sheet number four, SFM four and doing some conversions that you need help with. Um, here is your cheat sheet, you know, soil pH, keep it in the neutral zone, line line as needed, really pay attention to soil sampling, how many pores you should be collecting, read, brand convex, the, the recent um, spec sheet. Um, again, regular soil testing, right? So although we have a requirement for regulatory three years, but if you, if you have resources available, I highly suggest doing an annual testing you're going to get a really good information from that soil testing report and very useful that can help you save more actually on fertilizer and other things you're going to add. So some take home message, soil variability, that's the issue, getting the right sample. Um, and then public labs do a really good job, interpretation, they're going to do all the things, but these reports become knowledgeable, um, then you won't have so many other things to sort of think about that what could be there or could not be there. And feel free to reach out to us. You know, if you get a soil report from someone else and you and you, you are kinda of not sure what's going on, uh, feel free to call Emily or Brian. Um, so they will be happy to walk you through it, what it means. But they're pretty simple. Okay, so I think we are actually hitting the clock. So I'm just gonna quickly talk about manure because manure is such a sort of good source but also messy and complicated if it's not in a way that it should be. So when you look at a manure, it's this digested waste, right? So it's coming from different animals, whatever they might be, um, and depending upon which species you have, you will have a different nitrogen form. Most of us mammals, it's mostly urea. Uh, if you look at the birds, the, the, the ducks and other, the other things, they add a different type of nitrogen, which is also available equally. Um, and then when you look at species, it's a combination. So you have a feed, you have other microbes, you also have the components of cell wall that are excreted back uh, in the gut and go back into, into that uh, sort of manure combination. So a lot of soluble nutrients for nitrogen. Um, and most of the nutrients are actually pretty labile. They become available pretty quickly, which is good because that's why we're adding. Um, and again, like some of that, there's also some components of manure that's really good in building organic matter over a longer period of time. And that's why the fields who have received manure over a period of time usually have good organic matter. So, but this is the problem with manure. When you're buying a bag of fertilizer, you have a grunted analysis, right? Because it's also needs to be certified. So you get a definite of my what you are getting. With the manures, you don't know. So how would you know? That's where manure testing becomes really critical. There are a lot of variables at play in manure. Uh, and I think here is, you know, animal, where it's coming from. Was there any bedding material used? How was manure stored? Um, you know, the weather that was surrounding. Um, how much do you have? <laughs> What's the nutrient content? So by the time you look at all the things and you're like, well, I don't know why manure, but yeah, you know, it's not that complicated, but knowing what you have and analysis can really help you to make really good decisions about, about using manure. And how I, I think that's enough. <laughs> so you got, you, got, you got the hint, right? It's messy and complicated. 
calibration, that's another issue, right? You know, so if you're not calibrating your spreader, all these things have no meaning. Like, th this takes time and effort, and I think um, there are a bunch of resources on the internet and the website, and you can consult those, it will be useful. Feel free to call our advisors if you have any concerns on how to calibrate that equipment, they will be happy to walk you through. I'm sure they also do some other demonstrations in different places to, to make sure how you, how you are calibrating. So we're going to run through some scenarios. Okay, so this is actually an interesting part. So let's imagine a scenario, right? So a farmer is going to have corn for a grain, and this is his yield goal. Um, based on, you know, this, uh, our nitrogen is based on the yield goal. So for 200 bushels, a farmer will add 200 pounds of nitrogen. Um, the farmer did the soil testing and figured out that he is in high category, so no phosphorus is needed, uh, but the farmer needs potassium. Right? So that's his use. If, he, if he's using fertilizers, he can pretty much, you know, do one nitrogen separate and potassium separately. But in this scenario, a uh, farmer is going to use a dairy liquid manure, and in this case, he's going to inject, he's going to add 4,000 gallons. Right? And he, in this situation, they also did nutrient analysis, <coughs> and they found out that when he adds 4,000 gallons, um, they're going to add 81 pounds of nitrogen, 17 pounds of uh, phosphorus, and 41 pounds of potassium. Right? So if you look at what the needs are versus what's in the manure, it's different. Right? So that's part of the issue with the manure. So now you can sort of calculate on that basis. It's not that complicated that as long as the first number is lower than this, now you can just subtract. Uh, and again, there's also nitrogen credits depending upon the legumes or the manure that farmers have. So it's gonna get some nitrogen credits and just get 25 pounds. Uh, and with manure, uh, he's gonna get 81 pounds. The total needs is 200, which means that 94 pounds of nitrogen could be added from fertilizer. It's pretty good, right? Um, with phosphorus, he has no need but the manure a slurry has a phosphorus, so you're gonna add a little bit in this field, which is okay because you, the, the field's also gonna remove some phosphorus in this situation. And potassium again, like, so you need to get a need for 78 pounds, but manure is only adding 41, so you can add the remaining from fertilizer. This is a great way to actually use manure, where you're supplementing with fertilizer at the same time, not causing more phosphorus to build up. All right, so let's look at scenario two, right? So this is the same situation, same needs. Uh, in this case, the, the goal of the farmer is that I want to add, get all the nitrogen from the wall. So in this case, you know, the calculator that there's about 25 pounds nitrogen credit that he's getting in the field. Um, and then if he, in the manure, he calculated that if he adds um, this amount, he will get 70, 175 pounds, which means the nitrogen needs will be fully met with that manure application. Um, so again, no need to add by fertilizer, but phosphorus now, more phosphorus is added in this situation, so not very high dramatic anymore. And in case of potassium, you're adding a little bit more. So you can still live with this scenario. It's not a bad scenario. Um, Let's look into another scenario. Again, now you have the same yield goal, but very different needs, right? So you need, to, in this case, you need nitrogen for sure, but also phosphorus and potassium. And in this case, farmer wants to use a poultry litter at five times per acre. And you know that poultry litter is a rich source of phosphorus, we all know that. So when he's adding five tons, he's gonna end up adding 151 pounds of nitrogen, which is good. Right, so and he's going to need a little bit more from uh, fertilizer, but not a whole lot. But look at the middle number. You know, so in this case, need is 47, but poultry manure is such a rich source of phosphorus, it's going to add a lot more. Also, look at potassium. You're going to end up adding a lot more potassium. So this is part of the story. Now imagine this type of poultry litter added into the same field. The need is tiny. This is not a one-year scenario. If this is happening over decades, you're going to have a massive buildup of phosphorus. That's why we have many fields in our state which are saturated with phosphorus because of this issue that we've been adding manure based on the nitrogen that adding a lot more phosphorus. So really play, uh, in this case, you know, pay very close attention to that. And once this level starts building up, it's also going to change the management on the farm. 
once you get the high phosphorus level, then the DNA has to switch from nitrogen based management planning to phosphorus based management planning. And in many cases, it's not going to be happy. <laughs> right? So the, here is where you come into play. You can really help farmer to make sure that he's aware of the issues that he's going to run into. So in this scenario, discourage him to utilize because this is the bad idea. You know, maybe add a little bit manure, manure in this case that you can get some phosphorus and in this situation, some potassium. Uh, and there's a base for use of phosphorus and potassium in this situation. So this is sort of best scenario, the one that we taught in the beginning, which is, you know, a combination of manure. So you're getting nitrogen, some phosphorus, potassium, and you didn't talk about micros. But with this application, you're going to get enough micros and also sulfur that there's never going to be a need for it. All right, so again, take regular manure sampling. We talked about soil sampling variability. Welcome to the world of manure. It's going to be messy. A lot of variability. So if you have the ability and resources, I will take several samples. Again, make composite samples to make sure you have a really, really good sample uh, so that you have a good analysis to base other recommendations. So, uh, again, keep an eye on your phosphorus levels. Make sure you calibrate your equipment. This is also exciting and boring when you're trying to do it, but again, this can result in a huge error. Uh, more importantly, keep packets because they will be useful just as with the salt testing report. If possible, incorporate, and I think in many cases there is some incorporation required in other state. Um, and, and use manure on corn seeds. This is another issue. Some farmers, they like to use manure on soybean. And you know, the story that the beans don't need actually nitrogen. We don't have recommendation because they can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere by itself. So this is that's also wasteful. The best way is to utilize on corn field um, so that you can get all the nitrogen that, that you need. And again, like do other estimates, which seems difficult, but they're actually pretty easy to, to work with. And that's all I have for you this morning. <laughs> Any questions?